Development of Quantum Theory Mechanics is a branch of physics that deals with the motion of material objects. Classical mechanics, as described by Isaac Newton, described how objects move in our everyday perceptions. Newton's laws of motion described the motion of objects as small as the tiniest grains of sand to objects as large as planets, which at that point was essentially everything that was known. To show how gravity works on Earth and in the skies, Newton designed a thought experiment. He imagined firing a cannon from the top of an extremely tall mountain. From his first law of motion, he knew the cannonball would travel in a straight line at a constant speed forever. But gravity pulls the ball downward. If its speed is low, the cannonball hits the earth near the mountain. The higher the speed, the farther away the ball lands. If you throw it faster, it comes farther away, even faster, farther away. Even faster, it may go a thousand miles. Even farther, it may actually go almost halfway around the earth and there hit the earth. Newton imagined that if its speed were high enough, the cannonball would travel all the way around the Earth and settle into orbit. The orbit of the cannonball around the Earth was a balancing act between the cannonball's tendency to fly off in a straight line and its being yanked back towards the center of the Earth continuously by the force of gravity. So in Newton's picture of the world, there were two things the natural tendency of an object to travel in a straight line which was true on earth or in space or anywhere and there was the attraction of gravity which was true on the surface of the earth and it was true up in space Newton's breakthrough was to see that the moon's orbit around the earth and a cannonball's motion on earth were governed by the same law of gravity So Albert Einstein and many others began to see that Newton's laws didn't correctly describe the force of gravity or objects in electric and magnetic fields. So Einstein uh, furthered laws, Newton's laws of motions when he suggested the theory of general relativity. The 28-year-old Albert Einstein is still a patent office bureaucrat. It has been two years since he published his special theory of relativity. In 1907, Einstein agrees to write a new article explaining special relativity. It was called special relativity for a reason, and that was because it really only dealt with moving at constant speeds. Einstein realized that his theory failed for accelerations. But in our universe, everything accelerates. Einstein knows that for his theory to work, it has to account for everything in the universe. And the ambitious Einstein decides to advance an even more radical interpretation of the universe, a general theory of relativity. Doing this will require him to take on his scientific hero, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton said that if an object falls, it's because there's a mysterious force called gravity pulling it down. But you know, Isaac Newton himself was not satisfied by that. Objects move because they're pushed, not pulled. So what is pushing this? Newton didn't know. So Newton simply threw his hands up and said, I don't know. So I'm going to invent something called gravitational pull. And Einstein said, no, this theory can't be right. He's in his office at the patent office, looking out at the window, and he imagined a man working on a roof. And he begins to wonder what would happen if one of those men were to fall off the roof. He had a vision. The man will not actually be feeling his own weight. He would be weightless. And then he imagined, if you're in an elevator and somebody cuts the cord, what happens to you? You fall. 
but the elevator falls at the same rate you do, so you are weightless inside the elevator. So then Einstein got it. There is no such thing as gravitational pull. The Earth has curved the space around me, and space is pushing me into this chair. Space itself can be curved. Why does the Earth go around the sun? Most people would say, well, the sun's gravity is yanking the Earth toward the sun in a circle. Wrong. The Earth is going around the sun because the sun has warped the space around the Earth and space is pushing, pushing the Earth toward the sun. He had a new theory of gravity, a new theory of the universe. General theory of relativity is one of the greatest achievements of the human mind. It is beautiful and simple and profound. And all the best theories of the universe are just that. So Einstein's relativity was um, a step in um, a step forward from Newton's laws in that it helped to explain the motion of objects of large objects in the sky to an even higher degree of accuracy than Newton's laws did. But the problem with uh, um, general relativity is that it applies to very large objects like planets and galaxies and stars. Um, but it doesn't apply to very small objects like electrons and photons and protons and atoms. So an, around the same time that Einstein was working on relativity, um, others were working on um, theories that would help to describe the motion of very, very small objects. Uh, so one of those theories was uh, Niels Bohr, who suggested that energy levels of small particles like electrons are discrete like a staircase um, whereas energy levels of larger particles like baseballs are continuous like a ramp so uh, this is a bit like what we were talking about before with the rungs of a ladder and the electron being able to exist on the rungs of a ladder but not in between so the electrons can exist on these steps. The electron can be here at one or two or three or four, but it can't exist in this space in between the steps. If you're walking up these steps, you can get this high, one foot high or two feet high. But if you're walking up these steps, you can't be one and a half feet high because there's nothing to put your foot on here, right in the middle. So that's the same for the electron. It can't be halfway in between two levels. It has to be on this level or on this level or on this level. So in classical physics, it can be halfway in between. It can be here, or here, or halfway in between, or halfway in between that, or halfway in between that. In classical physics, it's more like a ramp, where any value of energy, um, any particle can take any value of energy continuously along a ramp, from very small values all the way up to very large values. So classical physics, we call this kind of system continuous, this kind of function where you can have any, you can have a 1 or a 2, or you can have 1.5, or you can have 1.25, or you can have 1.1125, and so on and so on. You could put any number of, of numerals after the decimal point in classical physics. In a discrete system like this, you can't. You can have 1 or 2. You can't have 1.5 or 1.25. Those values aren't accessible. The only values that are accessible are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's it. You can't get at any of those values in between. So energy can't be transferred in amounts of any value. It must be transferred in packets of energy that are called quanta. A quantum is the smallest packet of energy available. So quantum mechanics is um, a branch that describes the motion of very small things and how they uh, move and how they transfer energy. And they transfer energy in these, quant in these quanta.
In 1912, just after graduating with his doctorate degree in physics, Niels Bohr took a job in Ernest Rutherford's laboratory in England. A year earlier, Rutherford had introduced an amazing new theory about atoms. It was thought that atoms were solid spheres of positive charge with negative electrons mixed throughout. But according to Rutherford's model, atoms look more like tiny planetary systems with most of the mass focused in the positively charged nucleus of the atom and the negatively charged electrons rotating around the nucleus like the Earth around the Sun. Rutherford's new model was a scientific breakthrough, but almost immediately he found a hole in his theory. See, the problem was that if you got a nucleus with a positive charge and electrons in orbit about it, then we know that the electron should very rapidly orbit into the nucleus. It should do it in a fraction of a second. That's a very secure prediction of classical physics. And, that, and that, that's catastrophic. What it's telling you is that atoms cannot exist. It means that you and I would not exist. The atoms would have no way of supporting themselves with the large volumes that they have. Rutherford was ready to give up on his atomic model, but Niels Bohr saw a way to save the theory. He was so excited, he canceled his honeymoon. He had to delay his wedding, cancel the honeymoon, and his poor fiance, instead of going on a luxurious honeymoon, had to take dictation as her husband dictated one of the greatest masterpieces in physics because he himself could not get himself to write down the paper. What he proposed was that you would not allow the electrons to move in any orbit about the nucleus, as you could according to classical theory, but only to occupy certain very well-defined orbits about the nucleus. There would be an orbit here, an orbit here, an orbit here, but there would not exist orbits between these. There's nothing in between. In between exists nothing. And that's very non-Newtonian. If you take the Earth and you would, you would move the Earth a little bit closer to the Sun, no problem. It would have a different orbit, would be stable, would have a different time to go around the Sun, no problem. That you cannot do with an electron around a nucleus. You cannot just change the orbit by a little bit. You have to change it by, so to speak, a lot. Bohr's idea that electrons can only have fixed orbits drew inspiration from other new theories. That light and energy are waves made up of discrete energy packets, or quanta, now called photons. But most physicists disapproved of Bohr's theory that would apply this quantum idea to matter. In 1926, a 25-year-old German physicist named Werner Heisenberg came up with a matrix-based mathematical description of atoms that supported Bohr's view but classical physicists remained unconvinced because the math was unfamiliar, the ideas too abstract. In May of 1926, an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrodinger published his theory on wave mechanics, which offered an alternative to Bohr's particle theory. The essence of the debate was, was the electron a particle or was the electron a wave? The Schrodinger school believed that the electron was a smeared out wave. It didn't exist at one point in space or time at all. The electron was a wave that permeated all space and time. Physicists loved this idea. We had a physical picture. We could look inside the atom. Physicists knew how to calculate with waves. They calculated waves as an undergraduate in college. They knew how waves went around uh, in, and formed orbits. So the appeal of the Schrodinger picture was that it was pictorial, it was almost Newtonian. It was continuous. None of this quantum business. And you could calculate with it. So who had it right? Was matter made up of waves, like in the Schrodinger model? Or was the Bohr-Heisenberg model right, and matter was made up of particles? The competition to find the answer was fierce. The essence of the Bohr-Heisenberg picture was that the electron was a particle. However, there was a, a certain amount of uncertainty with regards to where the particle was. Now, one day, Heisenberg was so paralyzed, worrying about all these problems, that he took a walk in the park. Outside his institute, there's a famous park, and late at night, he walked through the park, wondering 
how can it be? How can it be that you don't quite know where the electron is? And then in a flash, he understood. Because to understand where an electron is, you have to look at it. To look at it, you have to shine a light on it. But when you shine a light on it, that disturbs where the electron is. So the very fact of observing an object changes its location. Therefore, he realized that uncertainty is an essential part of his picture. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle showed that it is fundamentally impossible to measure the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time with accuracy. The more you know about a particle's position, the less you can know about its momentum. And the reverse is also true. The more you know about the momentum of a particle, the less you can know about its position. And when he finally had that idea, he realized that he could merge the Schrodinger picture with the Bohr-Heisenberg picture to give us the modern day theory of the quantum principle. In other words, the electron is a point particle, but you don't know quite where it is. And the probability of finding it at any given point is given by a wave, the Schrodinger wave. So we now have this beautiful synthesis of waves and particles. So this was the same um, discussion that we were having earlier about whether a photon is a wave or a particle. And it turns out that photons have properties of both waves and particles. We could say it's both. So as time went on, the question became, well, is an electron a wave or a particle? And again, the answer turned out to be an electron is both. It is a particle. Um, but since we don't know exactly where it is, its probability distribution makes a wave. And so this quantum mechanics says that a, an electron, just like a photon, just like light, is a wave and a particle at the same time. So if we shine um, light through two slits and they were particles, then we would expect a certain result and it turns out that when we shine light electrons through two slits, they don't behave exactly as if they were particles. They behave a bit as if they were waves. Quantum theory works, even though it shouldn't. And perhaps the ultimate proof of just how unsettling quantum mechanics can be is something called the double slit experiment. It will make you question whether reality exists at all. This simple configuration shoots particles of light called photons one at a time through two tiny slits in a screen. With a laser which produces light, this light is attenuated such that only one photon at a time emerges. This photon passes through a two-slit assembly, and then we have a camera which registers the pattern behind the two-slit uh, assembly. So what we see is that the photons arrive one by one on the screen, some here, some there, and it looks pretty random. Since the photons travel one by one, some through this slit, some through that slit, you would expect them to leave a pattern of two stripes on the wall. And you would be wrong. They mysteriously create a band of stripes. This is what you would expect to see if a constant beam of light shined through the two slits. It would spread across the wall like a wave. So how can single bullet-like particles of light create a wave pattern? This could only happen if the particles go through both slits at the same time. In other words, the particle is in two places at once. But strangest of all is what happens when you put detectors next to the slits. When the photons are being watched, the wave pattern disappears. 
Take away the detectors and the wave pattern comes back. This suggests that we can change the way reality behaves just by looking at it. Does this mean that reality itself is not real? The modern answer is that the path taken by the photon is not an element of reality. We are not allowed to talk about the photon passing through this or this slit. Neither are we allowed to say that the photons pass through both slits. All this kind of language is not applicable. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Killen. So experiments like these suggest that the particle, although some experiments do show that it's a particle, an experiment like this shows that the electron behaves like a wave under certain circumstances. Um, but as we saw in the, the previous video, um, when you put a sensor here to see um, which, which of the slits the electron goes through, if the electron goes through both slits at the same time, it makes this pattern. If the electron goes through the left or the right slit, then it's going to make this pattern. So if you put a camera here to see which of them it goes through, so you're trying to catch it going through both at the same time. When you put a camera here, then you can't catch it going through both at the same time, because when you put a camera here, you're looking at it. And by looking at it, you're causing it to, you're changing it. You're causing it to either choose the left or the right, so then it will go in the left side or the right side. So um, Heisenberg discovered a set of complementary properties, some of which are momentum and position. So we can't know both the momentum and the position in, uh, in infinite accuracy of a particle. The more you know about one of those properties, the less you know about the other. We call these complementary part, uh, properties. So the wave and particle nature of the electron are also complementary particles. As you know what more about the wave nature of the electron, then you'll know less about its particle nature and so on. So it seems that as we're studying um, the electron and photon, depending on which way we're looking at it, we can get it to look like a particle or like a wave. The uncertainty principle that Heisenberg stated shows that the uh, uncertainty in the position is relative to the, the uncertainty in the uh, velocity multiplied by the mass. So there's always some uncertainty in position and velocity. And as the mass gets larger and larger, the uh, less this uncertainty becomes important. So we could even say that to some extent there's uncertainty in the position and velocity of a car as it pulls up to a stop sign. Um, but since the car weighs so much, the mass of the car is very large versus the mass of an electron or a photon being so small, that uncertainty uh, principle becomes much less important for large objects with large mass as it is for small objects with a small mass. So the uncertainty principle does apply to large objects as well. It's just not as important because the mass of large objects is so much larger. So large particles, because of this, because the uncertainty principle is not important and large objects uh, have a large mass, that means that we can say large objects are, for the most part, deterministic. And that's how we're able to play pool. And that's how we're able to predict what the stars are going to look like and the way that the, the stars and planets move in the sky. is because these, uh, these particles, if we know the past state of one of these particles, then we can predict the future state. So for example, if I hit a pool ball right here and I hit it and it's going this way, then if it, it's right here, then I know that in the next instant, if it was here and it's right here, in the next instant it's probably going to be here. And if it was here and then here and then here, in the next instant it's probably going to be here. And if it was here and here and here and here, in the next instant it's probably going to be here which means that if I know the past states of the particle, I can predict the future states of the particle because this ball is deterministic and it's traveling along a straight line. 
Well, we cannot say that with particles that are very small. If I throw a baseball, it has one path. It has one trajectory. It goes from here to here, and here's the path it takes. If I throw an electron baseball that's the size of an electron, it goes from here and it ends up here, but where is it in between? Any one of these dots are the possible positions that that electron could take on its way from point A to point B. It could be at any of these positions. We don't know where it is. It spreads out. It's, it, where it, it's, it's probability of where it is, the probability um, of the location of that electron spreads out like this. So all we can say for sure when we're looking at the um, location of particles that are as small as electrons and photons is we can define a probability distribution. We can say that there's a 20% chance that the electron is right here. There is a 20 plus 40, so there's, or excuse me, there's a 40% chance that the electron is within both of these circles, somewhere in both of these circles. There's a 70% chance that the electron is somewhere within all three of these circles. There's a, probably a 95% chance that the electron is somewhere within this fourth circle, all four of these circles. So we can say, we can only say that there's a probability of where the particle is. We can't say exactly where the particle is. So with a baseball, we can say there's a 100% possibility that the baseball is right here, 100%. With an electron, we cannot say that. We don't, it does not have a classical trajectory. It's not a determined particle. So we've seen before that the energy of an electron, um, the kinetic energy can be measured as one half of the mass times the velocity squared. So electron energy and position are also complementary. Uh, position and velocity are complementary, and energy and position are also complementary. So for an electron with a given energy, the best we can do is describe a region in the atom that has a high probability of finding it. So like in the, in the pitcher's or in the catcher's mitt, is it 20%, uh, 40%, 70%, 95%? It's, it's within this region somewhere. There's a 95% certainty that it's somewhere in here. It's the best we can do with an electron. Schrodinger's equation um, describes uh, the um, wave properties of particles. So it allows us to calculate the probability of finding an electron with a particular amount of energy at a particular location in the atom. Solutions to Schrodinger's equation produce many wave functions which is this letter psi. A plot of distance versus psi squared represents an orbital, a probability distribution map of a region where the electron is likely to be found. So I know this is a lot of uh, pretty dense material, but the idea is this. Um, an orbital looks like this. Just like the catcher's mitt, there is a small probability that the electron is here, there's a bigger probability that the electron is within this region. There's an even bigger probability that the electron is within this region. So I don't know where the electron is. The best I can do is say there's a probability that it's somewhere within this region. And that's what an orbital is. So when I solve the Schrodinger equation, then I uh, get one point. And if I solve the Schrodinger equation with lots of different energy uh, or uh, solve the Schrodinger equation to put in um, lots of different uh, position probabilities, then I can develop a plot of distance versus psi squared, which represents the orbital.